Um, I think we should start right at 10. Uh, two things. One is, of course, we are glad to welcome uh, money to present on the transformation, the automation of capital markets. Uh, the other point, a uh, couple of other points. One is, of course, this is under the um, capital market SIG under Hyperledger. So we are bound by the antitrust such as it is uh, ex that exists today in, the, uh, in uh, Hyperledger. And please read the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. The other is um, the code of conduct, which says that you can, uh, you have to be reasonable uh, in treating others and uh, you have to disagree without being disagreeable, basically. And let us uh, hear from Mani. He's going to start his uh, presentation in a second. Thank you, Mani, for uh, showing up and presenting. And let me uh, stop my video so that you can focus your attention on Mani. I'm just going to share my screen. Let me know if you guys are able to see the screen now. Yes. Okay, good. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, you know um, joining uh, this this session on uh, automation of capital markets. I am Manny Pillai. Um, um, I started OTC Digital. About actually, it is nothing but more an extension of what I've been doing and on in um, capital markets and interest rate swaps and derivatives and cash for the past twenty years. Uh, OTC Digital is is a, sort of the latest incarnation of my prior fintech ventures, uh, primarily focusing on bringing automation to capital markets, combining uh, traditional trading platforms, uh, blockchains, ledgers. Uh, it, you know, um, combining um, what, what we are today is of a, a multivariant ledger. So it's not just building upon a single ledger. It's, it's we are now uh, working with multiple ledgers. Each one is um, set up uh, or focused on a, a certain market segment. Um, so this is a, this presentation is a collective effort of all the efforts we all, all the. Uh, challenges we faced over the years and how we try to address. Um, but I try to uh, you know, address this in a more generic fashion and then towards the end, we can see if you have time, we can squeeze in a demo. So let me start with, um, you know, uh, obviously uh, automation is known, very well known concept in capital markets. So we, it's, just, it's something been in, uh, in various segments, uh, um, particularly on, on the execution side. Uh, we have seen a lot of automation over the years, uh, but on the post-trade side, there is you know very little of anything of uh, post-trade automation, and you know we will go through this uh, you know the next half an hour or so to see look at the current market structure, why do we need automation, how do we transform from centralized finance to decentralized finance? That's a very hard and complex topic, you know, but we'll try to simplify as as simple as possible. Uh, what is required for transformation? Is it just blockchains? Is it, is it ledgers? Is it data standards? Um, you know, we, we think it's a combination of all of these things. Um, as we look at the, the various data standards that exist today, and then how newer emerging or uh, digital standards so like common domain model, how that can help in the a process for automation. Uh, you know, again, as I said, we are in a multi-chain world. Um, more interestingly, the market is shifting more away from private-based blockchains to more public and permissioned blockchains and how capital markets can operate. You know, the, the concept is very similar to how I would uh, phrase it as how uh, FedEx and UPS uses public infrastructure to deliver goods and services uh, to their clients in, in a very similar fashion. Um, banks and broker dealers can really think about using public permissioned blockchains to actually uh, achieve their goals. Um, 
I will briefly touch on CBDC white paper, which we earlier presented in uh, in, in this hypologic um, um, in capital markets. Finally, uh, you know, look at very specific um, options on the automation within the securities. Capital markets is a very broad topic. Uh, we are obviously not going to touch things on insurance or real estate or you know uh, mortgage backed securities, but let's stick to what's what's you know more pertinent to securities. Um, you, know, you can stop me at any time. We, it is, we, we are happy to discuss in, in depth where, where needed. Um, so let's start with why do we care about automation? And the best way to answer is, is, is the cost. So here is the recent uh, paper written by, uh, you know, published by Accenture that identifies the revenue structure of the various market segments within capital markets. Uh, I don't have to go into the detail. All that we can look at is the total revenues are closer to $1.1 trillion, out of which the biggest cost structure is $673 billion on costs. And you can see that this is riddled with, you know, legacies and infrastructures. And when banks look at this thing and say, how do I, you know, bring in automation to reduce the cost? So there is a, definitely an incentive for all market participants to automate as much as possible. Uh, within the market, uh, within the various divisions, with the various desks, um, uh, inter-desk or in, um, intra-desk, as well as um, looking at uh, inter-party as well, so that there is a big opportunity to reduce costs. And that's the main goal thrust for some of the initiatives towards blockchain. Um, but then, of course, we now add in the newer emerging uh, classes like uh, cryptos that adds a layer of um, innovation and as well as new market opportunities, which could be only be better addressed through blockchain uh, solutions. And hence, you can really see there is a real impetus for the market participants to squeeze, uh, squeeze in cost through automation and using effective use of uh, blockchain technology. Uh, just to look, give you a background, uh, you know, here are a few slides. I'm going to just highlight to see this is something that we all know, and uh, it was presented very often in hypologic capital markets about cross-border payments, how it is so inefficient with so many different market players, and SWIFT is SWIFT, and CLS, and, you know, you know various different uh, banks and intermediaries, uh, how blockchains uh, and the emerging CBDCs can effectively reduce the time, the settlement cycles, as well as the operational cost. So this is something we all know. Uh, I just want to highlight what that is. The second part of it is I want to show is on the capital markets uh, structure itself. This is again a paper by Northern Trust. Um, uh, by the way, we, all, we will make this uh, presentation available um, on the capital markets uh, side, you can always you know, get back and look at all these uh, white papers as well. Uh, this is what Northern Trust you know, highlights. It's a much more simplified form of what happens today in the ecosystem today um, be between the various parties from, uh, as you can see here, and what they envision as what would happen in, in a decentralized uh, blockchain world, but they name it as an ecosystem 2030, which is, pretty far away if you really um, think about it. But what we have today is, you know, a lot of these solutions are already in place or uh, are, you know, almost ready to be integrated and deployed. So you would see these solutions emerging pretty soon. And there are efforts, like if you could look at DTCC solutions for uh, private equity, and then you have all these exchanges from ASX to uh, Deutsche Börse, you could see a lot of these things are early, early versions of a you know, a kind of a blockchain network, uh, capital markets network is being formed. So I, I don't want to go through the details because we all know the classic examples of the problem, existing problems and what a digital solutions, you know, can help. Uh, but the idea is that is this is not too far away. We are, you know, in 2022, 23, as you could see the ASX is planning to go live on 2023. They already started their uh, earlier testing phases. So as, as more and more participants start coming in, you would see capital markets uh, forming a very core, core base of technologies on blockchain uh, based solutions uh, over the next few years. If you want to go a more complex is, is this is something that I have dealt with in interest rate swaps over the past 15 years as it evolved. And you could see that this is a you know, very complex infrastructure where uh, a lot of intermediaries play 
and they have a vested interest in, in continuing that sort of a game. Uh, and it's very complex to unbundle this thing and create a blockchain. And you know there are attempts, several attempts being made uh, to see how we can bring in, but that's a challenge. How do we, how do we get around these intermediaries? How do you work, make them work with blockchains? That's a challenge. Um, so it's not like we want to go head on with you know, more complex structures like derivatives, uh, but definitely you know, we, there are uh, big opportunities to start with you know, basics of cash and lending and you move up the value chain, uh, then these things can also be uh, addressed. Yeah, any, any questions, you know, please uh, stop me and we can always um, you know, discuss them in, 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 in at least in detail if necessary. So uh, one of the challenges is to look at the, you know, is to look back in the mirror and say, what, what, what are the problems we face for the, are we faced for the past, you know, 15, 20 years and, how do we rethink, you know, building trading systems or building workflows between parties? Um, that's why I, you know, I, I put up these challenges. Should we even think about you know, end of day, so day uh, or start of day, T plus one? Whereas if you look at the crypto markets, is you're talking about instant settlements. It doesn't mean everything has to be settled instantly because credit plays a big role in capital markets. So there is some merit intermediary, which is a, what we call as a peer-to-peer -peer session based trading and netting solutions, which means in a, in a blockchain world, a dealer can you know, create tiers of their clients who are like, a, uh, or let's say the, the top tier clients, could they could settle more frequently, four hours, eight hours. And then the lower tier clients, they could set up a settlement cycle of you know, T plus one, T plus two, depending upon the type of the profile of the client. So there's no necessary that we should all have to follow one standard formula. Uh, banks can choose, or essentially market participants can choose uh, how frequently they want to uh, uh, trade and uh, net and settle. Thus, you know, you can strike a balance between credit utilization and liquidity. Again, looking at the commodity, looking at all the various different market segments and desks, uh, you know, do we still look at these things as independent products or should we treat it as a digital tokens of different characteristics and, and life cycles. Thereby, uh, you can abstract away a lot of the common elements. And this is where a, a data standard like CDM helps a lot. Uh, we will come to that. Uh, again, consortium has become more of a, you know, it, it's, a, it's a term of the past. More and more banks are looking at saying, how do we all collaborate and, and create and work with permission networks and essentially create what you call as a cooperative network. Compete where you have, where you will, and then cooperate where you can. Uh, that, that's the model that's emerging in the market today. Um, another possibility is, you know, questioning centralized clearing. Again, we can do, it, it doesn't mean a peer-to-peer -peer clearing will uh, outdate or replace, but it can coexist. So where there are efficiencies to be had, as I said, again, in the, the step number one, peer-to-peer session-based trading and clearing, that could actually help in a way reduce the dependency on a centralized clearing, which is again, a time base, a T plus one, T plus two. Uh, so you could have both models, much like the way we talk about exchanges and decentralized exchanges, uh, both can be complementary. Uh, and then again, the, uh, carrying on the same thought process to, you know, we all built front offices, middle offices, back office systems, the risk management systems over the years. Uh, and every, every bank tend to build their own. And then they would then you know, start um, creating, uh, in order to be interoperate between their own desks, they end up creating reconciliation processes within the desks and then across the parties. It's just a big, a big you know, um, requires intermediaries, intermediaries to step in and provide those services. Uh, these in a, in a blockchain world, these can obviously be um, minimized or reduced or eliminated, uh, whereby uh, once you can define the standards and processes, a lot of this automation can be had. Market data is an interesting concept. You know, there's a lot of push for reducing the market data cost. And already we are seeing solutions like um, Solana, which is actually uh, there is a you know, network called Pipe Network, whereby all the HFT firms have started contributing market data prices uh, into those networks, whereby you're, you're seeing that purpose-built 
market data and reference data chain is emerging for capital markets. So it's, it's, it's interesting that from, uh, if you look at the blockchain evolution from, you know, Ethereum, from Bitcoin to Ethereum, which became like an all-purpose computer to now what the market is now gravitating towards is purposeful built, built uh, blockchains, whether it is security tokens by Polymesh, uh, consensus, or it is market data by um, uh, Solana, or, or if you look at uh, stable coins, specific stable coins uh, issued by uh, Circle or Paxos, uh, and then obviously we're bringing in CBDCs. So we are now entering into a truly a multi-chain environment and you know, interacting with all of them is a must and effectively utilizing these networks that will all help us usher in automation. Okay, now just to give a very high level what we are today from a capital markets perspective, what we are seeing today is, is a kind of like, you know, in a very simplified form of broker dealers and custodians working with their buy side. And then on the other side, you're having exchanges or inter-dealer brokers for execution. Um, securities being governed by CCPs and CSDs, and then the cash on a central bank. This is what we are in a, in a very high level um, you know, operating environment. How do we transition from this world to a DeFi where we are seeing um, more or less the participants have not changed, but the way they're going to interact in the future changes substantially with the introduction of asset chains um, which covers crypto securities, and then you are bringing in the cash. You know, uh, we're bringing in stable coins and CBDCs, and then going along with centralized exchanges, you're now bringing in protocols, automated market makers, lending protocols, and then onwards the higher level on options and even such a products are emerging. And even an interesting thing like a treasury, you know, how today the an individual desk within a capital markets uh, interacts with its own treasury department, uh, with its own treasury to uh, manage their day-to-day -day operations will change a lot because now you're dealing with, uh, from an account-based system, you're switching over to a token-based system. That means even it, you know, a, a very uh, you know, mundane task like a treasury management within a bank, it's, it has to you know, go through a revolution, if, if not an evolution, in order to meet the demands of the new market structure. And again, that brings a bigger part also onto the custodians, um, instead of being simply bookkeeping. Now they are, you know, almost becoming front and center in helping and coordinating movement of the assets between all the parties. Uh, any questions so far before I move on? Uh, yes. Um, obviously, today, you know, a lot of things are, well, most things are centralized. How much do you think um, decentralization will be valued in the future? Um, if you can, can you elaborate on valued means in the sense, in what context? Do you mean like, do that? you think there will be like a complete 180 shift to where a bunch of people, like a bunch of like the big banks and you know, the entities you, um, you're talking about will go towards a decentralized model I mean, obviously there's different levels of decentralization like Ethereum versus Solana. So like, how much do you think decentralization would be a priority? De decentralization is a priority, but it's more of an evolution. And, and even if you look at the early birds in the capital markets are, if you look at mostly our, our centralized parties like exchanges, ironically, um, they are trying to protect their territory and then they're trying to move forward and bringing in um, blockchain technologies so that, you know, yes, there are some efficiencies to be had, um, but it is not a truly a peer-to-peer a -peer market seg segment where we are, we are, we are uh, what we are seeing today. However, that smart model is changing. Now we are seeing more and more networks, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks appearing side by side. Now, will, you know, how long will it take? This may take 10, 15 years before we can slowly transition away from the, what we are having today to the, the new, new, to the newer market structure. Again, this by itself is not a 100% you know, digital marketplace where everything is decentralized, not really. If you really look at it, the exchanges are pretty much in control. And also the regulation forces you today in most market segments to use a CSD, a centralized party to you know, record, your, record your security holdings. 
the, the laws have to change, the, 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 the um, regulators have to become more and more comfortable with this new market structure. And you could see the tension between, like, for example, and what ACC treats in one month, another month, one, you know, how they treat these tokens and how, they, how their viewpoint changes. So it's going to take a while for, as a collective market structure to move, um, but, you know, it, it is moving in the direction. Yeah, as I said, this is more of a you know five to ten year uh, effort, in, and and we're talking about multiple different asset classes. So it's going to be a slow trickle by trickle. These assets move in, and then at some point, you're going to see a tsunami of these assets moving in mass, including public equities, could one day move into a, you know, a blockchain based infrastructure. Thank you. Um, so what's required, and, and I'll start with the data standards and look at what we have today and what, you know, uh, how we can, um, what, what can be done to uh, move towards a DeFi marketplace. Uh, obviously, we all know about FIX and FBML and ISO standards for uh, the, you know, the past, in the past 15 years, we use these standards for interacting. And as I said, automation exists today uh, using FIX. So you can automate a lot of those uh, on the execution side. Um, FPML is, is used more on the derivative side, ISO 2022 on the payments. Um, but if you look at these specific these uh, standards, are all broad specifications, and typically intermediary service providers I've given the names, they take it and then you know uh, enhance it and, or, and create their own version of it of the standard, and that's the version that you uh, end up uh, the market participant connecting to it. So it is there is no uniform standard. It's, it's mostly a multiple implementation of the same fix in FPML um, uh, ISO 2022 versions. And that means that you are you're fragmenting that uh, data standard. That, that's okay in a current model, but when you're moving into a peer-to-peer -peer model, who sets the standard? How do we come up even with one uniform standard? These uh, standards fall apart because they, they are more of a specification, not a truly a data standard. But that's what we try to come up with and say, if you want to bring into the enforceable smart, uh, smart contracts on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, you really need a very precise data standard. Uh, and also you need interoperability between networks. Uh, we, you, we are going to see a lots of lots of these uh, uh, blockchain networks emerging and we need a way for um, trades, contracts to move between these networks, much like the way how we are seeing uh, on the crypto market, uh, you know, a couple of years back, uh, interoperability was just a you know vaporware or talk, but today interoperability is happening on a large scale between these networks, and in fact, uh, that's become a norm for a lot of these chains to interoperate uh, very easily. You can move your assets, uh, in, in, all but in, in a wrapped form, or you know, essentially you can move from one network to another form, another network, much like the way how we do ADR tokens or you know, deposit receipt tokens in in, in capital markets today. So common domain model, again, we did some presentations before, does help a lot because it, it primarily looks at as a peer-to-peer -peer standard. It means for a given uh, product and given workflow, there is only one way to define the standard. If any two parties uh, in, in code uh, or code to this common domain model, you'll end up with the same exact definition or the exact same um, instructions. And that's where, it, it, industry participants like ISDA uh, or is, uh, basically International Swaps and Derivatives Association of long, uh, initiated about three years back. I was part of the uh, working group for the past three years defining the standard. Now it's been taken up by other, other parties as well, including Securities Lending Association and for fixed income by International Capital Markets Association. Uh, so this is becoming pretty much a digital standard that could be used across networks for interoperability and also to enable, uh, you know, represent uh, very well, uh, very well defined contracts that can also at one point stand in legal grounds. This is one of the interesting things. These specifications, you know, are not are not kind of legally enforceable because they're all uh, the messages that are being passed between these protocols are only temporary in nature at the moment. Parties agree to that uh, message, but once it goes into their respective systems, you know you're no longer are in, in uh, no longer are, are in sync. But a CDM, by the definition of it, which we'll get back to it quickly, can help uh, solve some of these problems. 
uh, very high level. It is, I, I call it as a more of a logical blockchain. It, it essentially creates much similar to a, a payload and, and, and a basic business process and inputs and outputs. Most important thing is that is it tracks or creates a lineage to the prior event. So by, do the, by creating events and having linking these events to prior events, you essentially create a logical blockchain. That means this CDM block or uh, data representation, or I call it logical blockchain, can then be uh, applied on any any physical medium, whether it could be a you know simple database to the blockchains to ledgers or whatever you have. It still you know holds its true uh, integrity uh, by time because these are all linked by hashes, much like the way blockchains you, you, you link a bunch of blocks through uh, through hashes. The CDM also creates hashes and those hashes linked with each other. So if anyone tries to modify any one of the block, or in this case, any one of the event, the whole event chain gets disrupted. And so that guarantees uh, that on a peer-to-peer -peer model, uh, these protocols can be used effectively. And also given a particular business event and a, and a particular uh, product type, uh, any two parties that define that event will end up, will end up defining or coming up with the same exact definition uh, in, in, in technical terms, JSON format. So if you take a hash of those, you will always end up with, uh, arriving at the same hash. So with that, we now we're able to look at the life cycle and we can model the life cycle from a, an initial order or origination, walking through the life cycle, of you know, various types of execution, allocation, netting, settlement. And interestingly enough, because of the CDM allows you to work kind of like a backward link to the previous chain, essentially as the operations move from, let's say front office to back office to settlement, you're also creating lineages or linkages back to the original uh, document that created this prior document. And hence, you essentially created a, a, a full-fledged audit trail. Uh, on the blockchain or database, wherever you store these CDM uh, data formats. That's very critical because now we are having an independent source of, very, uh, source of representation of data and contracts. And this can actually stand in, you know, even if you're under scrutiny in, in, a, in, a legal, in a legal setting. Um, so let's look at the you know, automation uh, in, in terms of uh, security lifecycle automation. Uh, we talk about primary market and origination, security definition, registration, subscription. Not much of automation happens here. Most of the automation we see today is on the exchanges in, in execution facilities. Um, in, um, you know, but there's a lot of opportunity for us to automate in the primary market. Uh, so similarly, if you look at the, in the secondary market, now you're bringing in DeFi and automated market makers and liquidity pools. This by definition, by you know, in, in incorporating their APIs, you can then start creating more automation on the uh, or a parallel automation to what are the existing centralized exchanges. On the post-trade cycle, uh, again, we could we broadly looking at lifecycle events going from allocation, netting, resets, dividends. Yeah, you know, all of these uh, operations today happen mostly manual, um, even within the same firm multiple different desks, multiple different trading platforms. Uh, it's, it's a very complex environment, a automation uh, of bringing this life cycle into uh, not only intra-desk intra or also between inter-desk or between parties uh, helps to uh, reduce the cost structure. That means you're eliminating reconciliations. You, you are bringing more and more towards a real-time um, trade life cycle and even possible settlements, which ranges from payment, you know, payment versus payment, delivery versus payment. And we generally, we call it as token stars, token star, essentially two parties engaging uh, in a series of trades throughout the day, netting, and then coming up with a net of tokens moving from one party to the other party. And then another set of tokens come moving from the other party back to the, you know, the original uh, party A, between two parties, party A and party B. So how this all can be automated using uh, infrastructures and blockchains is where a lot of work has been done. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can kick off a demo to show how, you know, we can show from primary market to all the way to settlement, how we can actually achieve. And check money at 10.30. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm going yeah, to, I'm going to wrap this thing off. Uh, at a very high level, if you look at it, this, 
what we have today is all trading platforms. Um, but what we are trying to see is that by bridging between trading platforms and ledger services, the earlier attempts today, we, you know, the, the earlier implementations like uh, in equity swaps by Exony, to give an example, uh, uh, other in infrastructure implementation from ASX, most of the work is done on kind of building a general purpose ledger services, but mostly on a single blockchain. Uh, but now the market has shifted focus to creating multiple blockchains. You could see specialization like, you know, Cordac providing a much more stronger workflow-based automation. Daml similarly gives you a Daml or even Hyperledger, uh, Hyperledger with um, uh, Corum or uh, Besu with the transaction managers provide you a workflow automation. And you obviously have enterprise tokens and then you have, uh, you know, public or private tokens. So essentially you really have to build infrastructure, not just connecting to the various blockchains and building contract services, but also the platforms have to be aware of, and, and, and they also have to you know, interact with these workflows. And so there's a lot of infrastructural change required on the platform side uh, to make this thing happen. And this is difficult because you're taking a legacy infrastructure, it is very hard to change the legacy infrastructure to adapt to this new model. And so what what's slowly happening is that is, newer asset classes or existing asset classes, we are building side by side this infrastructure along with this legacy infrastructure. So that over time, the newer types of platforms and infrastructure would overtake and replace them. As I said, this is more of a five to 10 year you know, um, effort. I'm going to skip this thing. Maybe if you have time, we'll come back because of this much more complex things about settlement and settlement life cycle. Uh, this is a good example of earlier, we, we put out a uh, white paper, Vipin and I had uh, put, uh, worked on this last year, and we showed how we can bring in automation using data standards and, and blockchains, uh, essentially bringing, I'm not gonna go into details, the, the, this paper is available, and we also have, a, you know, the presentation is also available on uh, capital markets, uh, just to show that how this can be automated between parties, not only between, you know, single uh, central bank, but also how we can, uh, you know, bring in um, cross-border contracts and payments as well. And a lot of effort has, has been going on in, in, in between the banks, and BIS has been, you know, spearheading a lot of the effort between the banks, and how do we bring in uh, cross-border uh, implementations. So I'm gonna go on to quickly on the demo side of things and see what we can do and how we have ad addressed. And again, this is a generic uh, definition of, of a workflow. It's not necessary to what OTG Digital has implemented, uh, but in general, a lot of the vendors are, who are you know, engaged in this, uh, looking towards of, a, of these kind of workflows and implementation with the blockchains. So here I'm, I'm giving an example of uh, a capital markets network where you know set of dealers, investors, uh, custodians, and then you know, you know uh, working with. In, in this case, we have given a quarter network, but it could be as well be a, a DAML based or hyperledger based based network as well. It's, it's, the underlying infrastructure does not matter, uh, and we have the asset classes ranging from you know CBDCs to you know bank issued coins, stable coins. And then you have cryptos, so you have a whole bunch of networks uh, or, or blockchains to interact with. So what we have um, shown, or we will try to demo today, is how a, a dealer would go through the life cycle by initiating and sort of creating and registering a token or a security, minting these tokens uh, and bringing it to the marketplace, and then investor interacting with the dealer using digital RFQ. So you don't need any, as you see, you know, all this through the process, we are trying to show how we peer-to-peer -peer model will work without any inter intermediaries. It does not mean intermediaries cannot exist. As I said, centralized exchanges are there to play, uh, but here's an example of how we can bring in completely a peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure between parties. So again, uh, an investor engaging with the dealer to do an execution through an RFQ or an order or a subscription, whatever the form is, and then the dealer then uh, you know, uh, negotiating and executing the trade between the buy side, essentially between the buy side and the sell side, the trade gets executed. And throughout the day, any number of these trades can then be netted between these two parties. And then the netted transaction is not only being propagated back to their own corresponding custodians, the custodian or a back office desk for the dealer and this custodian representing the investors so not only they get the kind of like a, a 
a carbon copy of the trade in, uh, in automatically into the system. We also you know, enable the regulator to see the exact trade. And this is where CDM helps a lot because you are now a, a trade that has formed originally between two parties gets propagated to all the different desks and they all have a real-time view of the trade. And also as you net the trade, the netting, the, the netted trade in positions are also being exchanged, but it are, are being distributed to these uh, entities. So reality means that means that none of them are double keying or entering the data twice. The, the, the data capture gets once and shared between these two uh, between all the necessary parties. And you can see it's all peer to peer and privacy oriented. Only the relevant parties are in are, are involved in the transaction much different than what we see on in a you know public blockchain where every trend transaction is propagated to the, all the nodes uh, in, in copper markets you really want privacy uh, you know, preserved and that's what you know, a, a workflow based network preserves this now moving on to the actual settlement involves the custodians engaging taking those traits which are representing the dealers and their investors and exchanging what we call as uh, settlement instruction between these two parties, which is the settlement instruction in blockchain wall or it's uh, exchanging uh, wallet addresses uh, securely, of course. And then each party going ahead and then committing or transferring the tokens. Here's where a newer uh, um, change of blockchain like Polymesh, which allows you to provide, which enables um, settlement finality. Uh, whereby two parties, when they execute, both parties have to con confirm to the uh, trade and only then that trade gets finalized as opposed to cryptos where you unilaterally transfer, then it's up to the other party. If you send it or you, know, you pray and you transfer, if, 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 if you hit the right address, you're good. If not, you lost the asset. So that, those problems are solved by the third generation of blockchains like Polymesh, which brings in uh, settlement finality. So I'm going to, you know, finally the the uh, the executed transaction, the settlement instruction is then propagated back to the investor. So everyone is in sync by the end of the session, whatever the session may be. It could be, you know, uh, T plus five minutes. It could be T plus eight hours. It's whatever the parties decide to sell. I'm going to skip to the demo and we'll come back, you know, more uh, if you want, if you have time to look at some of the uh, um, details of uh, settlement. So what I have. Um, um, brought here, here is a, a dealer running a platform. In this case, we have um, implemented structured products, private equity debt. For the demo purposes, we are bringing, uh, bringing in a structured product, which is much non, very similar to a bond, uh, whereas the coupon is tied to the performance of the underlying, which is, prim which is primarily an equity index. So the life cycle of a structured product is very similar to a bond. You create a security, you, cre you know, create a subscription whereby you know, solicit subscription from the buy side. The right-hand side, I, re I represent a customer. Uh, this could be any number of buy side clients. And then you, know, you go through the process of registering the security, setting up the prices, issuing means minting the tokens based upon the subscriptions, and then distributing the tokens uh, to the parties and then settling the tokens. And then you go through the remaining part of the life cycle, uh, which involves at the end of the term, how do you do the final fixing and then the redemption of the, of the uh, tokens themselves. Very, very similar characteristic to bond. As I said, um, the only difference is the coupon is linked to the performance of an underlying. The underlying today is equities, but capital markets are looking at saying, how do I tie up to a crypto performance? So someday, pretty soon, you're gonna see a structured product on Ethereum or, 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 or you know, Bitcoin or whatever underlying is. Not only this, I'm also going to show you the second screen where this represents the custodian for the sell side, I call it custodian two, and the custodian for the buy side. So now let's see how all of them can collaborate and uh, engage in a trade and settle. So I'm going to start with very quickly uh, adding a new security, which is, as I said, is very similar to a bond. I'm going to simply call, you know, for lack of time, I'm going to just type in some jumble XYZ. Uh, I'm going to give it the name, uh, XYZ note. I'm going to leave out some paying agents. It's, 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 not, it's not relevant here. This element uh, references obviously XYZ is, is the underlying symbol, 
setting up the nominal or the notion or you know, size of the size of an individual token size. Uh, interest rate, the, typically this agreed upon, I'm going to put a 6% interest rate. The barrier is an interesting concept in, 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 in instruction note where the buy side or the investor is given all the upside potential and the barrier is, is the downside or essentially a put option. At that level, the dealer would then up to that level that you know the buy side is protected and be and if anything below that barrier level that then the buy side takes the risk so yes essentially if you put an 80 percent uh, barrier level that means that this, if the price is at hundred dollars if it drops up to ninety dollars still at the end of the day the, the buy side gets the full uh, investment but if it drops below eighty dollars then they start taking in uh, um, hits to their notional or their principal but from a large perspective, you can make these things you know, very similar to a bond. Um, the location, I'm, I'm going to skip all of these dates. And issue size, I'm, you know, whatever. A thousand and issue percentage is all simple terms. I'm going to leave out the uh, currency is the same. Um, you know, single, it's a bullet swap. And you know, defining all the QZIPs and all the details. So by adding a security at this point, what's happened is this, as a dealer, his, his intention is now to create the security, distribute to their clients, and then solicit subscription, and then you know, um, uh, offer them the bonds for whatever the term period is. It's a, essentially, I think it's a one year or two year bond. To do that, the dealer would now go and say, hit subscribe. A subscribe would essentially saying, do you want to send these things to all of your customers for subscription? So at this point, when we hit the subscribe, what is done is that is using the Coda network as a workflow, it just transmitted the security definition and all the details to the buy side. So the buy side can see the details of that here in this case. Not only that, we are also going to see the same information passed on to the custodians. So the custodians are also in sync with that security definition. So you know, single entry point of the whole network shares the infrastructure. Coming back to again to, to the buy side, the buy side clicks on, you now they say, oh, I'm interested in subscribing to this, clicks on a subscription, asks for how much is the quantity, let's say 500, 500 to make it simple. Adding the subscription kicks off to their subscription list as well as the dealer gets a subscription. Now, this is only an in interaction between the buy side and the sell side. The custodians are not in mall. So if you really look at it on the custodian side, there is this the subscription information is not there for XYZ. This is the prior trade I did, nothing on XYZ. But on the dealers and the customers, you'd see that subscription is available. Now the dealer obviously is going to get subscription from all of their customers. When the time comes in to issue the security, they would then actually uh, mint and now we'll go through the process of registering and minting, which is nothing more than selecting that security and then registering, which means essentially at this point it goes into the blockchain. So here we use Polymesh as a blockchain and it goes and registers and creates the record with uh, all the characteristics of these underlying instrument, uh, followed by um, you, on the day of the issuance, you really now, you know, in a bond, like any other bond, it, this, this needs a reference price and needs to fixing. And that's where the fixing comes in. So at this point, the fixing price is zero. So, and so you know, none of them are seeing the price. So I'm going to set this price today, today being the, let's assume today is the issue date, I'm creating an issue price. And I'm going to pick a number 75 and set the price. When you set the price, now you can see that the price is not only updated on the dealer side, it's also distributed to the buy side and to the custodians. So again, underlying the process of sharing data on network and workflows and processes. So at this point, we have the information, we have set the, we have set the price, it's a matter of now issuing the tokens. So again, go back and actually and the issuance process essentially minting these tokens. Since we know in this case, we have, there's only one subscription, 500, 500, we really have to only mint 500 tokens. And that's what it says, issue 500 tokens in network and you say, yes. So at this point in the PolyMesh, in the blockchain, we go and actually uh, create or issue that uh, or mint the tokens. Now you're ready for distribution. So you go ahead and, and then the dealer goes and kicks off the distribution. So when the distribution comes in, you could see that this is where CDM comes into the picture. The trade 
is actually propagated as a CDM, uh, underlying CDM data structure to all the different entities. And the trade is now confirmed or essentially allocated in this case. What we mean by distributed is essentially they're allocated of their security holding, but not settled yet. This is primarily the dealer asset. Here is the allocation. Now we are going to get into settlement. And you can see, go on to the custodian side, they see the allocations as well. Now the custodians can then actually start engaging in the process of settling the trade, which is going ahead and then processing the settling. I, I will stop that because settlement takes a while to go through the whole life cycle of settlement. Uh, for lack of time, I'm going to stop at this point and ask questions, I mean, uh, take any questions. But you could see the, uh, the overall theme is, you know, touch point is only one touch point. Everybody else shares using data standards, using blockchains. You can, you can get the entire workflow from all the way from uh, origination to settlement. So I'll stop at this point and you know we can take questions and you know explore more. Don't hesitate, guys. Uh, ask questions, please. For those who are not familiar with the uh, capital markets, I guess this uh, is a rather daunting uh, demo and all created by money, uh, which, you know, basically it is a, a capital markets in a nutshell. I mean, it is, it has all the activities represented, which may be uh, very uh, not familiar with, for most people. Yeah, anyway. I mean, it is more daunting, but you know, but the idea is the same. You know, you you're originating, you're distributing, and, and you're settling. Very similar to how you deal with cryptos today. Yeah, but it's the entire life cycle, right? Yeah. So, any anybody has questions, Connor? Uh, where are you seeing like the most interest from people, like for the products that you're creating? I mean, the interest is there in all the different banks. We are, we are, we are, we are engaged with you know, a few banks at this point. Um, the challenge has always been KYC AML. That's the main sticky point in a lot of the blockchain implementations today. And that's the reason why banks are hesitant to adopt even cryptos because you, know, you don't know who the other party is when you're engaging in, in any, any type of crypto transaction, which is against the, regula I mean, the regulators will not allow such trades in, 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 a, in a highly regulated environment where banks operate. So where there is real uh, I mean, you know, take up is more on, as you say, the bonds and uh, structured products and capital market pro uh, projects where there are a lot of interest, green bonds, you know, uh, these are all newer asset classes. So that's where you really take off will be good, including cryptos. So one of the things that we are actually exploring and bringing is treat cryptos as a security token. It's a very different concept, uh, but it's nothing more than like how Cryptos move as wrapped cryptos or a wrapped bit, uh, Ethereum or a wrapped Bitcoin moving from one network to another network. So what we are saying is that is if we can move at, or, or interoperate with these crypto networks and move them as regulated cryptos onto these uh, block, regulated blockchains or, um, or compliant blockchains like Polymesh, that's much easier for the banks to operate on because you know now who your counterparties are. Uh, these blockchains have identified, uh, you know, what's called the decentralized identities. So that's where the real take up is. The capital markets is going to take, uh, take off a lot of these ideas once we solve uh, identity and KYC. Uh, AML is much more easier for them to handle once you have the basic concepts of identity incorporated into the core blockchain itself, which is happening now. I think Sandy is asking about uh, event handling in uh, post-execution corporate actions, basically. Uh, so corporate action, yes, that's a, that's a good question. Corporate action essentially involves, the, it, it, it needs another layer as a transfer agent, um, but from a pure um, you know, workflow perspective, CDM addresses that whereby in this case, let's say a transfer agent acting on behalf of a um, an issuer uh, can uh, uh, 
based upon the issuer's direction, a transfer agent can create a workflow for dividends and that can be notified much similar way by how we talk about distribution of assets. Uh, we could distribute interest or essentially uh, notifying parties that asset in interest is coming due and then subsequently settling that uh, interest by actually doing a transfer of the underlying interest and whatever the currency could be, it's a CBDC or it could be a stable coins or whatever the underlying asset is. Um, Money, thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Uh, if I may just uh, extend that, like what about the events from the corporate elections? A lot of times, you know, uh, people have to make elections uh, for the corporate elections. How do you incorporate elections coming out of corporate elections here? Yeah, the, the, these, these are all comes into, I mean, we have not you know, addressed corporate actions per se yet. Uh, that comes the whole under a, a, under the uh, transfer agency. There's a separate initiative going on within the market uh, participants of how to bring in, uh, because these are highly regulated entities as well. Um, it's not just technology is a much easier task to solve, um, but more um, um, regulatory challenges need to be resolved. But yeah, it, it, it is a complex problem. Um, that's why you, you really are not jumping into the earlier asset classes you're doing are much more simpler saying dividends, or in this case, interest coupons and payments uh, or private equity you know, not dealing with complex uh, dividend structures. And as these products get matured and also gets approved by regulators, then it's a lot easier to address public, you know, um, um, corporate actions. So the if I, may, is, if yeah. I may just ask one more question on top of that, uh, Moni. So uh, you mentioned multi-chain earlier, right? So now this example was using Polymesh. Uh, and, and you also, I think in one place you were showing uh, the, I think the issuance was happening using Coda. So I'm assuming, <laughs> Your example here is already addressing multi-chain. So, so the assumption is that you can plug in multiple chains. Uh, yeah. We are, here, we are right? living in yeah, we are living in a multi-chain multiple chain world today. You know, we 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 connect with like for example for stable coins. You know, we use Circle. Circle Circle is a separate API and it can be uh, available on any number of chains. And you know, same thing with all the different vendors on the uh, stable coins like Paxos or Gemini. They are also making these things available on multiple chains. Um, so, you know, you know um, we, uh, today we already are connected to like three or four different chains, and this is only going to go into probably a dozen chains by the time in a couple of years where you're, you're talking about everything from market data, reference data, accounting, legal. Um, so you, you, any capital markets project will have to deal with multiple chains on day one. Thank you, thank you. And I'm assuming you, you as a part of that, you already have the, the different oracles or, or different external entities, like whether that's uh, compliance, uh, you, you can test on that, uh, all they kind of come in as a part of that. Right, so that's, that's right. where a lot of things are addressed by the blockchain themselves. For example, Polymesh comes up with a lot of compliance features. Um, you know, the decentralized identity. Um, uh, if you're going to issue a token and you want to restrict the token, those restrictions are on chain. So you can say, it's a, for example, it's a private equity and the equity is restricted to any other transfer can happen. So that the, the chain would enforce. We have workflows on Corda, which governs a much higher level uh, contract definitions, like for example, issuance of dividends or you know, even defining a more complex instrument, derivatives instruments. We have done a lot of work on that with the with the dealers on interest rate swaps and credit default swaps before. So which, which involves much, much more complex um, life cycle events. But they, you know, they, 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 as you said, the, in terms of adoption, you have to start from ground, ground zero, which is take up the basic assets, stable coins, work your way through, bring in lending, bring in then derivatives. So. It's a long process. A long process shortened by your uh, your platform. Um, well, it's not just us, there are others, but yes, our aim is to simplify, make it available um, so that the biggest, the biggest operation cost, what they are estimating, you know, we talked about the $600 billion, a, a platform like this can share about up to 50% of their operation cost, because you're talking about throwing away redundancies and intermediaries, reconciliation processes, each one having to build you know, tens of millions of dollars in technology infrastructure, operation staff. There's a lot of costs can be squeezed out uh, and you know, could be redeployed elsewhere more productively from a bank's perspective. 
Yeah. Um, so going back to that slide, which was where the uh, expenses and, and the various silos or, um, you know, where you showed, the, yeah. But if you notice here, the huge profit makers are the hedge funds, mm -hmm. the private markets, right. and uh, wealth managers, private banks, and brokers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have the, they are making the most. So how open do you think they would be to uh, this uh, squeezing this cost? Because wouldn't that expose them to also getting sort of disintermediated a little bit? Well, it's a profit is a profit, right? That's, that's different from the cost. The, most of the cost structures are borne by the sell side. They are the ones investing heavily on technologies. Now, obviously, you can look at the pockets of hedge funds. Obviously, I mean, they're going to be they are involved in a lot of this automation and execution solutions themselves, but for their own purposes. But if you look at you know common cost infrastructure costs are all borne by the big banks. And when we talk about banks, it's up both the front office custodians. You, know, you look at all the intermediaries. That's where the biggest chunk of you know, uh, cost is spent. And that's why banks are not able to get, you, you know, uh, much out of it and the return is very meager compared to all other asset class. So it's the banks to gain when they squeeze out the cost here. Yeah, um, but there is another push coming from regulators, which has to do with something like Archigos or uh, other kind of systemic risk which is hidden right now in these private markets. So there's no correlation between the private markets and the uh, public markets. Uh, and what happens when, uh, you know, huge um, hedge fund or in private investor takes positions, not just in public markets, but also in a combination of public and private markets. Yeah, then the regulate. Yeah, no, no, your point is right. And that's part of the reason is to say there is interest. There's definitely an interest because compared to public equity, private equity infrastructure is very, you know, very under, under, underdeveloped. And that's one of the key, key areas where they are looking at saying, how do we bring blockchain? That means automatically brings transparency. And when we talk about regulators, so all these trades, the regulators can demand you know, drop copies of the trades as and when this private equity transaction happens. So they can, much like the way they can monitor public equity as, as much as they can, they could do, should be able to use the same tools for private equity. Today, it doesn't exist because it's largely, you know, hidden behind. It's all mostly paper and, you know, not much of technology spent, but blockchains, you know, bring that, sheds a lot of light on all those processes as well. But as you know, there's contagion. Contagion is the biggest problem because whatever happens in the private market doesn't remain there because they are hedging or trading other securities that are in the public. Uh, and that same thing happens with, uh, with even with stablecoin for, for that matter. Uh, USDT, for example, says they have 30 or $40 billion worth of uh, corporate bonds. So, um, you know, they cannot do it right now very easily to ex expose all this stuff. Uh, so will they bring in more scrutiny? Uh, you do have that regulator view right. in your uh, solution. Right, right. It, it's every, every part of the trade. You know, when the trade gets executed, we have a drop copy goes into a regulator node. And that's a CDM, CDM uh, definition of the trade itself. So, which means the regulators don't have to worry about. If you look at today's marketplace, where they have for the for the for the derivatives market, they had instituted they want to have a drop copy of the trades or what's called as their trade repositories, but there are like so many different variations of implementations. They never defined a specification for it before. That's coming to bite them hard because even if they have access to those records, these are all different formats. But with CDM a data standard, you only have one single format to look at and. You know, but at the end of the day, you know, having access to the data is only one part of the problem. What are you going to do with it? 
<laughs> that's it. That's yeah, so it. so you need uh, some kind of automate, automatic aggregations to look at exposures, to look at other things because that, that, that is, humans cannot right. do this. Humans, right, right, right. there is no way right. human. Right, this is something that's, you know, um, there are a lot of tools available today in terms of uh, aggregation and looking at risk exposures. Is the question really is how much are the regulators willing to spend <laughs> on, on bringing those tools in house to do the analysis? Well, I mean, uh, the thing is uh, some of the market participants will have to pay for this because obviously if they are uh, engaging in high risk activities, they are also uh, getting yeah. high rewards. And uh, to take money uh, that is uh, a profit and keep it private and then when the Shit hits the fan, as they say, uh, to <laughs> to uh, go to the public, uh, you know, authorities with with and say, oh, you got to back us up now. You got to bail us out. You got to, <laughs> you know, whatever. So that I mean, that the, the technology cannot solve this problem. This is this is you know. This is no, no, no. What I'm sorry, talking about is the cost. So the cost has to be borne by the participants who expect uh, uh, bailouts or expect uh, you know other forms of uh, well, compensation you know, you know fdic works very well right After well all, for small out. amounts 150k yeah. Uh, yeah, well, well that's 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 open-ended for every investor so technically yes. that's a huge amount of money so they they could do that they could do that same thing to capital markets well but the question well, is, is uh, much more, i think much you should more. read uh saul omarova's paper on public ledgers which which talks about it and says, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have to make all of these uh, credit generation itself public, public mark, you know, public in the sense of governments, you know, uh, taking over. Because today the government is printing eight trillion dollars. Where is it going? Into the capital markets. They are buying uh, securities, assets that probably would have cratered in value during the pandemic. Uh, you know, mortgages would have gone down like you know, like a sinking ship, like the Titanic, down into the depths of the icy cold waters. So all of this is being held up by public money. So there is a huge outcry against this. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as technologists, we can only envision saying, bringing equality, or, you know, or bringing fairness and transparency to the marketplace. But it's still at the end of the day, it's the market participants, you know, have the power <laughs> to adopt or not to adopt or circumvent or, you know. Well, not if there's regulation saying you cannot and, you know, you have to do whatever is needed to keep the financial system intact. Um, anyway, so I think uh, we have passed the hour and it's been a fantastic presentation, very, uh, Comprehensive, and it has. Someone raised the question. Andy's raised the question. And quick last question, maybe. Where is the the question? I just saw. I mean, just raise their hand. No, no, that was a clap. That was applause for you, money. Applause, <laughs> applause. <laughs> I thought. I thought. It was <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I think um, nowhere else will you see not only the comprehensive reworking of the capital markets, but actually a demo that shows how it can be done. This is not just uh, talk. That's, that is the beauty of uh, money's presentation. Uh, so hopefully uh, we can make this presentation available to others and, and probably even talk about specific aspects of it. Uh, we are working in the capital markets uh, working group to create a NFT like structure uh, so that you know it would uh, then feed into the, let's say into the securitization process and how you know it is even a pre-issuance sort of thing. Uh, how do you assemble these NFTs into a group, like much like mortgages, and then securitize them? So it even goes, be, you know, 
before the issuance. So uh, these are all interesting topics and we are going to have a lab probably for this, for NFTs, and then we hope to integrate that with this whole secur uh, security issuance and settlement and custody and then obviously the payment side, which as you well know, it is, can be cryptocurrencies, can be stable coins, can be CBDCs, any form of payment. Well, in a generic sense, D star versus D star. So thank you. And uh, we'll uh, revisit. Uh, I think the, one of the things that we have to say is that if you want, if you think these uh, presentations are important, please participate, please uh, make suggestions and please come up with other interesting presentations. Maybe even, you know, next year, Bonnie can talk about some specific segment of this. Of course, putting it in the context of the entire, into the system of capital markets. But thank you all and uh, Hopefully uh, we'll have another, uh, maybe not, because by the time we come around to the next one, it may be already uh, Christmas season. But I think December 15th, we are planning to have a deep dive of AMMs, um, which I am hoping to present with the whatever, <laughs> whatever I can get together before then. So hopefully you will attend. Thank you. And thank you, thanks. Thanks, Vivian. Thanks.